The Lone Ranger are vampires, so that makes me Tonto, whatever. The point is SOF thinks they're protecting me, so I asked Yolandi to disarm any SOF snoopers that would notice you. Yolandi, my landlady. You have told her about me? I snorted. She told me. Turns out she's known all along, and she's a wardskeeper. She's real useful to have on your side. Khan was silent. I felt sympathetic. I wouldn't have liked the idea that he'd brought a friend into our business either. I was so keyed up that I didn't think about our disastrous last meeting till I'd already taken his hand, and then it was too late. He came back from wherever he'd been, presumably thinking about having another human foisted on him and looked at me. His fingers curled around mine. I had a sensor-around Dolby flash of the ten seconds that didn't go anywhere, but I hit the mental sensor button and it went poof. Listen, I said, although it was even less like listening than the non-sound of him moving toward me had been like listening. It was strangely easier, too, doing it with him, showing him my new roadmap rather than trying to figure it out myself. He knew the language and the landscape. I had a great idea. Next time Pat called me into SOF for a little more technical mayhem, I'd bring Con. Hi, I'd like you to meet my helpful vampire friend. Don't worry, my landlady is a retired, mostly retired wards keeper. And she says he's okay. Sure. Speaking of having more humans foisted, Pat would take some foisting. But I stared into Con's green eyes and aligned myself for him, like you might take someone's shoulders and turn them round so they're facing the right direction. Like you might point at a map once you've told your companion, see, it says mountains you see right over there. For a very nasty moment, I thought I'd somehow managed to remake the live contact, that we weren't looking at a map of those mountains but had been transported there, and the tigers were closing in. I jerked back, but Khan's hand helped me, and the jerk was like the click over of the kaleidoscope, and the colored bits fell into a new arrangement. It was weirdly something like looking through an aquarium at a lot of fish. The fish were whizzing around like crazy, cannonball fish. But I could see them individually a little, and they did look like distinct and specific little whizzings around instead of like chaos. This was interesting, although it didn't really get me any further. They were still moving too fast for me to track a pattern or make my way among them. But this wasn't as sick-making or as terrifying to watch or to think about. Presumably this was a good thing, but I remembered the quality of the terror and wasn't sure that not being terrified was wise or sane. What we were looking for was behind the whizzing things, and that was still just as sick-making, just as terrifying. I didn't like this animated three-dimensional map, Here Be Dragons, much worse than any dragon, which are pretty straightforward and straightforwardly alive, creatures that merely suffer that little character defect about liking to eat human flesh. Here be horrors indescribable. I barely sensed the dreadful loom of it, the differentiation of it from its manic pinball machine guard system, before I was repelled, repulsed, told, hurled away more violently than Khan had thrown me the other night, except it was Khan this time who caught me. I was flopped against him, his arm round my waist, my ear pressed to his silent chest. I grabbed at his other arm, steadied myself, balanced again on my own feet, which seemed very small and very far away. Have I given us away? Khan was out live. The world still spun. If there had been anything in my stomach but tea, the muffins were a long time ago, it might have come up. As it was, the tea sloshed vindictively a few times and subsided. The chain burned round my throat. No, said Khan. My sunshine, you must learn moderation. This is not an enemy you can defeat by rushing his front gate. I made a little choking noise that might have been third cousin twice removed to a laugh. I had no intention of anything resembling gate crashing. I thought I was just looking, except it wasn't, um, looking. No, said Khan. I could feel him thinking, if you were a new one of us, there are things I could teach you. I do not think I can teach a human these things. I sighed. I believe you. Like seeing in the dark probably doesn't bother you because you don't spend a lot of time seeing in the light, right? I am sorry. As partners, we left a lot to be desired. Was that him? Khan's eyes blazed briefly. Vampire eyes catching sight of their chosen prey. Don't look. Yes. Can you, can you track him any better from what I sort of showed you? Khan's face arranged itself in one of its invisible to the naked human eye almost expressions. 
I guess this one was irony. Note, existence of vampire irony. I'm not sure. It is certainly a signal we want to take heed of. How we take heed without jeopardizing ourselves unnecessarily, I do not yet know. Remember that was not live, as you put it. It was only your memory, your exegesis of what you saw. I shivered. I believe you were in less danger even last night than you may fear. What this is is a little like what are those machines with the strange radiance which attract insects to their deaths? Zappers, bug zappers, bug flies in, zap. You were zapped. The machine does not register the bug and merely zaps. I use these zappers also. Vampires don't use bug zappers, I said, interested. There's nothing like an immediate death threat to make you crave a little superficial distraction. I'd observed this phenomenon before. All that hanging around out of doors after dark you guys do? No. Wrong kind of blood? Vampires do not er, register on insect radar. Oh. At last, a really good reason to want to be a vampire. I was one of those people you invite on your picnic or your hiking expedition because the bugs will all crowd around me and leave everyone else alone. Sunshine, get a grip. Um, this isn't the first time I've been. Well, let me tell you the rest of it. I did. So last night was the third time and the worst. You don't think you might be using a sort of fancy zapper that says, Hey boss, this bug keeps coming back. I think I will ask you not to go near that place again for the time being, even if this Pat asks you to try. It's not Pat I'm so worried about, I said. It's the goddess of pain. Ah, his expressionlessness took an, om took an on ominous cast. Con, I said nervously. His gaze came back from wherever it had been and he looked at me. No, he said. I didn't ask what no meant. Vampires are a little like burglars, okay? If a bright, determined vampire really wants to get into your house, he's going to do it. And the best alarm system in the world and the electric moat and the 16 genetically enhanced Rottweilers and the wards and the charms and the little household godlets blessed by the priest or pontifexes of the religion of your choice and spellcast by the best sorcerers money can buy aren't going to stop him or her. You really don't want to piss a vampire off because it's a lot harder having all that plastic surgery and the hemo treatment to change your blood chemistry than it is to sell your house and go live in a small cabin with nothing in it to steal. Also, the hemo treatment not only costs a bomb, occasionally it kills you, although at least two of the global council members have had it done twice that anybody knows about and are still here. The usual, which is to say expensive, drastic options aren't available to coffee house bakers. Having realized that my being alive geared Bo up, Khan wasn't my best choice. He was my only choice. But the problem of having a non-human as your ally was that a non-human might not be, you know, very sentimental about the odd human life here and there. Especially not a vampire non-human about a human who shows signs of reading the mind of the vampire's human ally. And fair is fair. I wasn't very sentimental about vampires as a group either, was I? I can say no to the goddess if I have to, I said, perhaps a little more loudly than necessary. I am certain you can, sunshine, said Khan. He was gone a moment later. I didn't exactly see him go, but I didn't hear him moving away from me and didn't see the shadow among the other shadows after he was gone. I didn't pay a lot of attention, however, because I was preoccupied with the feeling on my mouth as if he had kissed me before he left.
More horrible, grisly marking time, wondering what was going on. Wondering what is going on behind my back. Wondering what is about to leap out of the shadows at me. At my worst, I could begin wondering if I'd imagined Khan. Well, he was the part that didn't fit the pattern, wasn't he? Nice, helpful, if somewhat unreassuring-looking vampire. Please. There was enough to remind me there was something going on, starting with the scar on my breast and moving for seeing in the dark and the spontaneous combustion of pillows, and ending perhaps with the fact that there didn't ever not seem to be some SOF or other at Charlie's now, and that any time I walked in or out of the door, whoever it was, his eyes fixed themselves on me. For a while, I'd made a point of coming in by the side door any time the coffee house was open, but I decided this was making a bigger issue of something I couldn't do anything about. So on days I was feeling hardy, I went through the front, let them stare. It had taken Emil's remark to make me no notice that Mrs. Bialski was occupying her table more than usual, but she'd nominated herself as one of my protectors in one very practical way. Some mangled version of recent events meant that we still had gapers coming in to check out if I had three heads or spoken tongues. They didn't stay long if Mrs. Bialski rumbled them, which kindly took the onus off our staff, which if they weren't getting as tired of my notoriety as I was, had every right to. But it was all too much and my overworked and exhausted brain started looking for things to call imaginary. Khan was such a perfect choice. I sometimes felt if I could get rid of Khan, I could be rid of all the rest of it. Bo, my heritage and weird talents, SOF suffocating interests a lot. I knew it wasn't true, but... I did have one nice surprise. One afternoon I came out of the bakery and discovered someone unfamiliar sitting at Mrs. Bialski's table and with whom Mrs. B was in deep conversation. I couldn't resist this so I slid along behind the counter to get a look without walking up to the table and staring. Not that my subterfuge worked because Mrs. B immediately raised her head and looked back at me. But this made the other person turn to look at what Mrs. B was looking at. She broke into a smile when she saw me. It was Maud. I hadn't registered till then that there was a large plate on the table between them that presently contained a light sprinkling of crumbs and one single remaining killer zebra. One of these mornings at 4.30 a.m. I was expecting to find an SOF lurking on a street corner too, and the fact that I didn't see one didn't convince me there wasn't one there somewhere. Pat had made an official offer to have me escorted to and from home which I didn't let him finish before I refused. Other than that, I hadn't seen much of him. Damage control of the goddess, I assumed. I was interested myself that my desire for autonomy was still stronger than my fear of what might or was about to happen. My unfavoritest corner when I arrived at Charlie's before dawn wasn't the nearest one, where Mandelbaum met the main road, but across the square at the mouth of one of the littlest and darkest alleys of Old Town, I pretended to fish for my keys and then made a big pantomime fuss about choosing the right one every morning as I scanned for shadows that didn't lie right. Shadows never lay right in that corner. I always felt watched these days. It was just a question of watched by whom or what. After I opened the door and went in, I relocked the door behind me before I turned off the alarm system. Used to be I didn't bother to relock the door. I'd asked Charlie to program an extra few seconds delay to the bell so I could. He'd looked at me worriedly, but he'd done it, and he hadn't asked any questions. He wasn't going to say the V word if I wasn't. We don't have a state-of-the-art alarm system at Charlie's. We can't afford it, but this is one of the ways having SOF friends is useful, and we do have some funny little gizmos that tell you if anything has been disturbed. Nothing went on being disturbed except my mental state. I was pulling maple cornbread out of the ovens at about 8 one morning when Mary came in to say Theo wanted a word. I thought about it. Okay, I said. Time I had a break, I guess. Theo sidled in like the reluctant bearer of unwelcome news. My private bakery kettle was beginning to hiss and burble. Tea? He shook his head. Cornbread? He brightened immediately. I was as bad as Polly, really, despite how long I'd been doing this. Someone wants to eat my food, they're automatically my friend. Someone who doesn't want to eat my food, they automatically aren't. This is an awkward attitude if you hang out a lot with a vampire. B 
Feel is an old enough hand in the kitchen, my kitchen anyway, to know to approach something fresh out of the oven with caution. He took the whacked off, still squadgy with baking end of a loaf of maple cornbread gingerly and watched happily as the approximately quarter pound of butter he put on it melted through. He would lick the plate when he was done. This was one of the advantages of eating out back. Table manners weren't required. I'd been known to lick plates myself. Once when I was teasing Kyoko about him, I mentioned he was a plate licker. She looked briefly interested. Oh, maybe he's human after all. Then she shook her head. Nah, he's SOF. This was in hindsight a better joke than I'd realized. You'd better get it over with, I said, after he'd finished licking the plate. He sighed. Pat would like to see you this afternoon. I'd decided in the pre-dawn darkness of the morning after I'd met the goddess what I was going to say the next time Pat wanted to talk to me. It won't do him any good. Something burned out the other night. I burned out. I woke up the next morning with a piece missing. It's still missing. He looked surprised, worried, then thoughtful, then to my great surprise, hopeful. He'll still want to see you. Why are you looking so pleased? He hesitated. The goddess wants to take over, take you over. She says it's because Pat destroyed government property, that he's bungled, that she wants to clear up the mess, that you're to be sent back where you came from after she's sure no security has been breached. That it was all playing anyway, but it's really because she's pissed off that someone may have thought of something or discovered something before she did. Something that might be important, something she might be able to use. And you think Pat will think that merely blowing out the country HQ, the county HQ's comm system on a bad call is better than the goddess finding out maybe it's a good call? Yeah. I thought of her walking nuclear reactor aura. If I wasn't afraid of the goddess already, I would be now. He smiled. It was a rickety sort of smile. You don't know half you don't want to know half. You want my advice, you, sick, you stick to suckers. When do you get off today? Pat'll come by just before. Free, I said. His eyes were wandering to the muffin racks. There were bran, there were bran raisin and oatmeal applesauce, allspice, waiting to go into the cases up front. Have one for the road, I said. Thanks, he said. He took two. Pat drifted in at a few minutes to free. I now knew that it would take a lot to make him look short of sleep, and he looked short of sleep. He looked worse than short of sleep. He raised hollow eyes and said, Hey, sunshine. You look like hell, I said. I was scraping out the last baking tin. Our Albion crowd would have to be really hungry today to get through this lot. And I'd made my special cream cheese sauce to go with the triple ginger gingerbread. I'd long felt that gingerbread, while excellent in itself, was still essentially an excuse to eat the sauce. So I'd always made twice as much pro proportion as the original recipe called for. Then it turned out that some of our customers were even more crazed than I was, so I'd started making three times as much, and we served it in little sauce boats. You got purists occasionally that didn't want any sauce, but the slack was taken up somehow. Thanks, he said. What's happening? He shrugged. His shoulder must be better. Maybe blue demon blood made you heal fast, too. What Theo told you. You look like you've been let out of the dungeon. I thought thumb screws were passé. The goddess doesn't need thumb screws. She just looks at you and you feel your brains melting. I thought of the other night. I believe you. Theo says you've lost it. Yeah, I'm safe from the goddess. No brains left to melt. No one is ever safe from the goddess. The path I knew surfaced and he gave me a familiar look. Shrewd, humorous, no nonsense. How lost do you suppose it is? I pulled off my apron and untied my hair. Lost enough for now. If I replace the fuse and the system starts working again, I'll let you know. Maybe you're just tired, said Pat. Maybe, I said amiably. Pat ran his hand through what, was, what there was of his hair. I don't like it when you agree with me, sunshine. It's not your style. What aren't you telling me? That I'm relieved not to have to try again, I said. I knew he bought, he bought it. He sagged, suddenly looking smaller and older. I felt a fierce pang of guilt, but I reminded myself that he believed that was the only good that the only good vampire was a staked, beheaded, and burned vampire. Briefly and wistfully, I considered a scenario where Khan and I had an SOF team with us when we whatever, 
But I recognize this as a fantasy, like a scenario where the goddess of pain retired from SOF and opened a daycare center. You look like a man who needs caffeine, I said. I'll grab us something from the counter and meet you outside. Do you want privacy or comfort? Comfort meant the nice little tables out front overlooking the square and Mrs. Bialski's flower bed, still doing its stuff with chrysanthemums and asters this late in the year. Privacy, he said. He was sitting at one of the unsteady tables in the grim little courtyard behind the coffee house that by never doing anything with, we could continue to avoid opening to customers. He got used to the roar of the kitchen fans, and Mom had a couple of tough little evergreen shrubs and pots that could survive the cooking fumes. Pat and I didn't talk about anything much after all. He drank the coffee and engulfed the various buns and other edible objects I'd brought, but absentmindedly, like a refueling procedure. The fact that he didn't argue with me about trying again, about trying to find out the extent of the burnout, about whether or not there really was a burnout, made me feel more guilty. Silence fell. Pat stared into nothing. I'm sorry, I said. He looked at me. I believe you, he said. He stood up. I'm not sure I believe the rest of it, but I believe you're sorry about it. He paused. Makes my life easier in some ways. Another gleam of the normal Pat, as he said, maybe by the time you've decided you're not burned out anymore, the goddess will have found someone else to crucify. I didn't say anything. He rubbed both hands through his hair this time and added, I didn't say this, but watch your back, sunshine. Then he left. Mel wandered out a few minutes after Pat had left. I was staring into my teacup. I'd forgotten to bring a sieve out, so there were tea leaves in the bottom of it, but I couldn't read them. You look like a woman who needs a good laugh, he said. Have you heard the one about the wear pigeon and the street cleaner? Yes, I said. Mel, do you suppose anyone is exactly who they say they are? Charlie, maybe, he answered, after a little pause of surprise or consideration. Can't think of anyone else. Hmm. I watched his hand lift off the table and rub one of his tattoos. Maybe I should have been thinking about tattoos myself, but there's a real big drawback to them. Any charm can be turned against you if you run into the thing it's supposed to be protecting you from, and the thing is enough stronger than the protection. A powerful enough demon adept or magic handler can overwhelm one, too, although that's serious feud stuff and not common. A tattoo feeds itself on you, so tattoos do tend to be a lot more stable and longer-lived than the ordinary charms you set around and hang up, including the ones you wear next to your skin. But a charm that isn't living off you can be destroyed a lot more easily if it does go or is sent rogue. A rogue tattoo can eat you up. It happens occasionally. Before five months ago, I didn't figure I needed any heavy warding. Now that I did, tattoos were the last thing I was going to try. Charlie, I said, I can't think of anyone else either. Not Mel, not me. Not Mrs. B, said Mel, smiling. Sunshine, I don't like metaphysics unless I'm drunk. It's only 3.30 in the afternoon and I'm working tonight. What's up? If Mel had really been trying to pass as a motorcycle hoodlum, his tattoos wouldn't be as beautiful or as elaborate. Lots of sorcerers go in for a super abundance of tattoos, but they mostly keep them hidden. They're harder to robe that way. Hence the long, enveloping robe and deep hood technique with inked up sorcerers when they're actually handling magic. For day-to-day, -day, walking the dogs, doing the shopping use, a lot of sorcerers disguise the real shape of their tattoos with cosmetics. Long sleeves and high collars are hot in the summer, and there are favorite sorcerer tattoos that go on your lips and cheeks and forehead, too. But I love this. Magic can apparently be a bit perfunctory about certain things in the heat of a transaction. Any tattoo a sorcerer wants working while he or she handles magic can't be distorted with face paint or pancake foundation because it may turn out to be the apparent figure that performs or, who, or doesn't. My dad didn't have any tattoos that I remembered, but I didn't remember my dad very well, and not all sorcerers have tattoos. But sorcerers are sorcerers. Tattooists mostly make their livings punching charms in leather, not live skin, and they'll try to talk an ordinary member of the public out of it if you already have, say, free magic-bearing tattoos, even little boring ones, and they'll tell you why in vivid detail. It isn't just the rogue possibility. A lot of magic-bearing tattoos can sort of unbalance you. You start not being quite sure where the real world lines are with a lot of tattoos whispering in your dreams. Of course, having lots of magic-bearing tattoos is one way of saying you're a tough guy. First, because the implication is that you need all that charm and ward power, 
And second, because you're hardy enough to bear the drain and the disorientation. But there are better ways of showing you are a tough guy than having lots of tattoos, partly because no tattooist who wants to keep his or her license is likely to cooperate, and the ones who don't have licenses are too likely to make a mess of it. There is only one small secondary quarter circles difference between a ward against drunkenness and another one against eye strain, for example, and the latter won't get you home safely with a load on. And that's one of the common simple wards, and most of Mel's tattoos weren't common or simple, but they were magic bearers, not ornamental. You could smell it like ozone when a storm is coming. And besides, nobody who had any pretensions to hanging out with a biker gang would dare have ornamental tattoos. Ornies are for wusses. Mel couldn't be a sorcerer. Sorcery isn't something you can successfully hide for long. But he did have a lot of tattoos. It was typical of him, too, that when he had come to talk to Charlie about a job the first time, he had his sleeves rolled up above the elbows and his shirt open at the neck, in spite of the fact that it was January and freezing. Although maybe he just had a good take on Charlie, who in his affable, open-hearted way enjoys Charlie's reputation as a place slightly on the edge. I said, Mel, who are you? Mel picked up both my hands and kissed them. His lips were warm. When he laid them back on the table, he didn't let go. I watched the sunlight twinkle among the fine hairs on the backs of his hands and the red and gold and black of the tattoos there. Both the hairs and the tattoos have an un unusually bright red edge, as if there was firelight on them or in them. His hands were warm too, human temperature, the temperature of the fire of human life. Speaking of metaphysics, I'm your friend, Sunshine, he said. Everything else is just static on the line. I wondered if he'd heard what Pat had said. I wondered who had done his tattoos. Maybe what I thought I knew about magic bearing tattoos was from, from the same script as the disquisition about how masturbating will make you blind and a cretin. Even Ubi's don't damage your sight. Maybe I should ask him. But then I'd have to tell him why I wanted to know. Even if you could successfully hide being a sorcerer, Mel still couldn't be one. Sorcerers are loners. They don't do things like get jobs as cooks in coffee houses or jive with their old motorcycle gang. Occasionally they hang with other sorcerers, but usually for some specific and time-limited purpose. Sorcerers are too paranoid to have ordinary human friends and too competitive to have sorcerer friends. The street version about sorcerers is that they are basically not to be trusted. Humans aren't meant to be that mixed up with magic, not even magic handling humans.